Hello everyone, welcome back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Andrew Charlton. Welcome to another Eurocontrol Aviation Straight Talk Live. Today, I'm delighted to say that we are having a chat with Mr. Michael O'Leary, uh, the CEO of the Ryanair Group, of course, a man who frankly needs no introduction, despite the fact that I just gave him one. Uh, we're going to talk about all those things that everyone's talking about at the moment, sustainability, uh, charges, fares, things like that. I'm looking forward to talking to him. I hope you are too. But before I talk to Michael, I would ask the Director General of Eurocontrol if he'd be so kind as to give us the market update. Eamon, over to you. Good afternoon from Brussels and welcome to another Straight Talk Live with uh, Michael O'Leary and Andrew Charlton. It's great to have um, uh, Michael back with us again this year. But at this time of the year, we're facing a very difficult situation. And the big debate at the moment in Europe is the whole question of vaccinations. Are we all fully vaccinated or what does the status of a vaccination confer on you? And when we look at the reality is the big debate at the moment throughout Europe is simply, is COVID vaccine protection fading? And the answer generally in Europe seems to be yes. It's not giving us perhaps the same level of protection that we anticipated. But in reality, of course, it does bring about the whole necessity for a booster shot. And in Europe at the moment, you know, many of the countries are now starting to roll out a booster shot programme. The UK have been particularly successful with a 21%. And look at Israel, where there's very strong evidence that having a third booster shot really kills off the vaccine. So I think we're facing a situation where now we're going to have to go down this road in the many months ahead. But one thing I'm worried about, and this is, are we back to lockdowns? I was really disappointed last week to see the whole situation in Austria, the whole it, it situation with the lockdown. And we followed that up during the week with, for instance, Locked, uh, riots in Belgium and also in, in Rotterdam. And there's societal pressure pushing back on restrictions and lockdowns because people are getting tired. And I think this is something that we have to be aware of is that it has gone on so long now that really it's very difficult for everybody to keep adhering to restrictions. Well, what's the impact for air travel? So here we are, the end of November, Christmas is coming up again. I feel like, you know, deja vu. And this is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Will air travel be impacted again or not? Now, in the EU, we have the COVID pass, but we also have wide scale recognition within the EU, EU from Albania going the whole way to the United Kingdom, Ukraine, the Vatican. All of these areas are really, really important, have all actually recognised the certificate. And it's spreading throughout the world. And it's important we start using recognised certificates. One thing I think we have to agree is this zero COVID policy has failed. Where you've tried it like in Australia, they're now starting to move to vaccines. And the reality is that restricting air travel does not stop COVID. Makes no sense whatsoever. So governments, in my view, should strongly resist the idea that they would impose travel restrictions because with the Delta variant, it's highly transmissible. It's already in your community. It's already moving. So really, air travel makes no difference. What I advocate instead, of course, is the use of the successful global systems and the EU digital COVID certificate is an example of one that is equally successful. So look, we're facing a difficult five to six weeks. And remember, as well as the COVID, we're in the flu season. We're in the normal season where there's pressure on hospitals as well. So societally, we've got a big challenge to face. So let's just look what's happened in the last week. Well, today's guest, Michael O'Leary's airline, Ryanair, has increased by 7% over the same week in 2019. So they've actually increased capacity, put extra capacity into the market. And that's really significant. And Michael will explain this to you why he's doing this later. Interesting, though, look at EasyJet and um, British Airways, down 43%. Again, the UK market is very, very difficult at the moment. And one thing I would say is we didn't get the bounce from the North Atlantic that we actually anticipated. So there are some issues that we have to face up to in the coming weeks as well. But still, we're doing OK. If we look at the traffic scenarios that we published on the 15th of um, October, you can see there, for instance, uh, and it's important to look at them, that we're at about 77% of where we thought that we would be. OK, so we're still ahead of where we are. But I'm worried now with restrictions and all of these kind of things that we might actually start trending a little bit lower. 
But at the moment, it's looking OK. And again, as I indicated before, we simply didn't get the bounce from the North Atlantic that we thought that we would. So what's good to say is that, look, Reiner are here with us today. Uh, thank you, Michael, for, for coming to us again. You know, we all know that as Europe's largest airline, 89 bases, 230 airports, a large amount of aircraft um, on order and targeting 225 million passengers by uh, 2026. This is a big challenge. And it's a really big challenge when you group it with the fact that you have to talk about sustainability. Yesterday in Europe Control, we had our sustainability summit and all the airlines attended and, you know, we had airports there, we had NSPs there and there was a huge discussion and a general agreement that sustainability is really top of the agenda and something that we have to do. So for Reiner, this is also a, an important thing. So the best of luck um, to everybody uh, over the next number of weeks. I want to say a special thank you to Michael for being with us today and a special thank you to Andrew as well and enjoy the next 45 minutes. I'm sure you'll find it interesting as interviews with Michael O'Leary always are. Michael, welcome back to Straight Talk. Great to have you. It's great to be back on Straight Talk, Andrew. Nice to see you. Indeed. So, Michael... Raymond's telling us that Ryanair's back at about 100, 104% of its um, pre-pandemic capacity. How's it going? I think we're back. Uh, volumes have up until last week, and when I sit here on Morrowind Monday, the 21st or 22nd of November, up until the last weekend, things were going great. Uh, volumes are back. I think we're back running at about 100% of our pre-COVID flight volumes. Pricing is down. I mean, we're, mm. you know, undoubtedly, we're incentivizing people to return to flying. I think our average pricing in the half year to the end of September was down about 30%. But nevertheless, you can see clear recovery and a run into Christmas. It has been disrupted, however, last week by the Austrian lockdown. You know, there's a kind of renewed concern across Europe about a fourth or fifth wave of COVID. Austria is locking down. Holland is locking down. The Germans are getting nervous. And so I think we're in for a fraught period between now and Christmas where, you know, it looks like Europe is going to get very nervous again at the worst time of the year when people are making their Christmas travel plans. Are you getting nervous about that? Do you think that's a I, I think we've no choice, in a way. I, I think people are, given the kind of coverage this weekend, there's now, you know, I think we've done great work as an industry across Europe at restoring confidence. Uh, particularly the October school midterm break was a very strong period for most of the of intra-EU air travel. Um, but now I think we're going to unsettle people uh, we're going to undermine confidence uh, despite the high levels of vaccination across Europe. I think it's inevitable that we'll undermine confidence between now and Christmas and that will disrupt Christmas and it'll also, I think, unsettle people between Christmas and New Year when they would normally start booking their summer holidays. Mm. Your strategy has very much been low fare, low fare, low fare to try to bring people back onto the mm. aeroplanes. You're lucky enough to be able to do that, aren't you? Because you're in a very solid place financially. But mm. a lot of your competitors aren't looking so solid financially. So what are they going to have to do? I disagree. I mean, a lot of my competitors look very solid financially because they've received multi-billion so injections of state aid. I mean, Lufthansa has received nearly 12 billion, Air France, KLM, close to 15 billion. Uh, and Italia, despite the fact it's gone <laughs> bankrupt again, has got yeah. about 3 billion in state aid. Even TAP, an airline that carries only 14 million passengers, is about to get 3.5 billion from the Portuguese taxpayer about 350 euros for every man, woman and child in Portugal. So I think those airlines having received state aid are in a reasonably strong financial position, but they're reluctant to restore flying. Uh, we think now we have the benefit of being essentially an intra-EU operator. There is huge pent up demand coming out of COVID. I mean, people who've been locked up for 18 months want to go and visit friends and family. Certainly we see small businesses getting back on the road. They're trying to repair and restore supply chains that can no longer be dependent on China. We see lots of people traveling to Portugal, to Eastern Europe, trying to restore supply chains or intra-EU supply chains. And we think that will continue. But uh, it's critical uh, that Europe continues to uphold the digital COVID certificate. Uh, it has been one of the great developments uh, mm. during COVID. The EU has had a huge success in its hands with the digital COVID cert, which was issued on the 1st of July. We need booster jabs though, to keep people um, kind of vaccinated people up to date with their vaccines. And I, uh, what I worry about things like Austria locking down is, you know, there, there's no sense to it. 
you know, they started off by locking down unvaccinated people and we asked what did that mean? Well, it meant that unvaccinated people could still go to work, go to school, go to supermarket. Well, what couldn't they do? Mm. It seems to be just basically couldn't go to nightclubs or restaurants. Um, now they've locked down vaccinated people. Like, why are you locking down vaccinated people when there's really no medical risk to vac- fully vaccinated people? So I think governments are panicking. I think there's a they're under pressure from the media. Uh, and I think we need to kind of be, you know, cool heads. I, I think we have to continue to uphold the freedom of movement, certainly within the European Union, and allowing people who are vaccinated to go to work and to travel. Do you see a sort of a, a return to nationalism? You know, people, countries putting up their own borders, countries behaving separately or differently to each other. I don't think so, but I mean, I think pa- countries will panic. I mean, I, no mm. doubt in my mind, the Austrians have panicked. Uh, you know, if you need restrictions, the restrictions should be imposed on non-vaccinated people. Mm. I, I, I really struggle to understand how you can restrict somebody who's been vaccinated. Yeah. Uh, and I think we're, we run the danger of more of those kind of, you know, ultimately non-medical, non-scientific based restrictions. Do I see a return to your borders? No, I don't. Uh, Brexit has been a disaster as we predicted it would be. Mm. And, and I think, you know, travel to and from the UK has become much more friction, uh, much more fueled. F- <laughs> friction fueled, exactly. And, and that is a challenge both for EU citizens travelling to the UK and for UK citizens travelling to Europe. And I don't think anybody wants to see that extended. No, right, I'm sure. Just to come back to what you were saying about the legacy carriers that had received all this state aid, but yet they're not jumping into the pond as enthusiastically as, as, as Ryanair, mm. as, as Wiz and the other low-cost carriers. Do, where do we go from here? What does European aviation look like a year from now, two years from now? I mean, the difficulty is it's all dependent upon are we out of COVID or not out of COVID? I mean, you know, up until last weekend, I think you could see a clear path to uh, transatlantic travel was restored in mid-November. I think there's a danger that might go backwards again. The US administration is very jumpy about case Mm. numbers. Uh, They don't spend a lot of time analysing vaccinations, which is what they should be doing. Asia, I think, would be a much slower recovery. And the challenge you for come you, from Australia, yeah, <laughs> yeah, precisely. And the yeah. challenge for the European airlines is, you know, that typically fifty to sixty percent of their short haul traffic is connecting from or to mm. a long haul flight. If you don't have the long haul flights, you know, there's a real challenge as to whether they can fill the short haul flights, and that's why they've had, you know, the the, the slot waiver system for the last two years. Now, I think the slot waiver system is manifestly uh, unfair. Mm. Um, if airports are being disadvantaged by it, consumers are being disadvantaged by it, you know, the airlines should operate their short haul flights and they shouldn't have the luxury of being able to sit their short haul flights on the ground just because you don't have long haul passengers to come and fill them. Right. But so do you think the legacy carriers are holding back on the short haul stuff in the desperate hope that they can get back to long haul? Should they be trying to come into your market and compete with you? Yeah. I mean, they should be. They should have an. They should have an obligation to use the use the slots or lose them. I mean, I can see a reason why you would say those are long, identifiably long haul slots, right? We'll protect the long haul slots because clearly the Asians are not going to travel next summer. The transatlantic might get disrupted, but there's no argument for allowing them to not use short haul slots and yet protect them. Mm. I mean, this is manifestly anti-competitive. It's not in the consumer interest. And if for a year or two, they're all forced to fly their short haul flights, even if they're all flying to Malaga, at least we bring down the cost of travel for Europe citizens uh, going to Malaga or to the Greek islands or the Spanish islands or wherever else there is. But the idea that, as has always been the case during COVID, the legacy airlines get, we break the state aid rules, we break the slot rules, we break the competition rules, You hear Lufthansa and Air France talk about being national champions. I mean, national champions of what? You know, overcharging consumers. Well, national champions. But you must be the national champion of Ireland, surely. I bloody doubt it. Really? Why do you say that? We don't want to be the national champion of anywhere. I mean, we're the largest airline in most EU countries in which we operate. Are you not the national champion of Italy? I mean, you're the largest carrier in Italy by a long way. Uh, We are, but I mean, I don't expect protection in Italy because we happen to be the largest carrier. We're the largest carrier because we deliver the best services at the lowest prices. And you've Alitalia, which has lost money for 74 years in a row, Mm. has now gone bankrupt for the 15th time in the last 30 years and will re-emerge chrysalis like as ITA, (laughs) um, which will again lose money for another five or 10 years. But But it's it's got a new logo. And that's true. And they'll probably spend millions getting new uniforms designed as well, as if... 
the uniforms were the problem with Alitalia. <laughs> yeah. We have to have a much, you know, we need Europe. This is a single market. And yet, you know, the single market has been dysfunctional during COVID. And we need to get back to have a functioning single market where deregulation of intra EU air travel uh, becomes the kind of central policy of the Commission again. So just to come back, though, on to the, the, the point I made earlier about your pushing charges down to try to stimulate the traffic, if you like. I heard you speaking at the Euro Control Sustainability Summit yesterday and, and you were saying there that an important part of your strategy is to have as many passengers as possible because then on a per head basis their emissions go down and therefore you're trying to price uh, as aggressively as you mm. can. Is, is that a fair summary? I think it is. You know, I mean, we have this ridiculous environmental taxation system in Europe of ETS, which exempts all the long haul carriers who account for 56 percent of European aviation CO2 emissions. Mm. So we exempt the most polluting uh, airlines, but we then transfer the entire burden of taxation on the most efficient, which is the low cost carriers with new technology aircraft who carry only European citizens. In, in so we exempt the Chinese, the Americans yeah. and the Asians, and then we double tax European citizens. So how do we tax the Chinese, the, the, the Asians and the I Americans? I think it has to be at the point of, you know, it has to be a fuel tax or at the point of uplift at European airports. So everybody pays, you know, the same tax on uplifting uh, aviation fuel. But regardless of destination. Regardless of destination. Mm. Now, there's something that can be done. But in return for that, you've got to get back these environmental taxes, APD, ETS, all those other taxes that have been massively and unfairly burdened on just Europe citizens. We are making European air travel less and less competitive with environmental taxes that are only applied to intra-EU air travel, while we exempt all the non-Europeans who can fly in and out, create most of the emissions, and yet may pay no contribution uh, towards their environmental footprint in Europe. So, I mean, this is this is breaking news, isn't it? Ryanair approves the tax, isn't that? I, I think we all have a burden, we all have a duty, uh, you know, to, uh, I think, A, reduce our carbon footprint, and B, uh, that there, there's a level or a, a level playing field for carbon taxation on air travel across Europe. We don't have that level playing field at the moment because we exempt all the non-Europeans yeah. of the long haul on this pretext of a level playing field, where then we distort the level playing field by double and triple taxing EU citizens going on their business on an intra-EU basis. And I think the real challenge, you look at the, the trauma of Brexit. You know, we've seen the UK <laughs> leave the European Union. I mean, one of the real challenges facing Europe is how do we kind of keep the peripheral uh, countries and states, you know, united or tied to the centre? And one of the key ways is, you know, low cost air travel. Mm. We can't have these. It's fine for Mr. Tillemans, who's Dutch, to be proposing all these environmental taxation or environmental taxes on aviation. Uh, well, of course, the Dutch scheme largely exempts KLMs it connecting yes. traffic across Schiphol. So in typical Dutch fashion is do what we say, just don't do what we do. Um, but the threat to the people who live in Ireland, in Cyprus, in Malta, in the Balearics, in the Canaries of these environmental taxation, we don't have an alternative. Mm. I don't have a train or, a, or any other way of getting to, this, to, to Brussels from Ireland except to fly. And we cannot be taxing the peripheral states of Europe, just so that you can keep the Dutch happy while they exempt KLM and all KLM's connecting traffic over Schiphol yes. from any environmental taxation. So a lot of that, I mean, the connecting traffic is short haul before it becomes long haul. Yeah. And, and you, so how, everything you say is right, I think, everything you say is right. But I just can see massive political arguments about trying to impose a tax. The Chinese will squeal, the Americans will squeal, this will be... You know, let them squeal. So what? You want to lift? You want to uplift town fuel, aviation fuel at Europe's airports? There's the tax. Yeah, right. At least then everybody's paying their fair share. Mm. There's no argument for we uplift short tax on short haul flights that pay a disproportionate environmental tax, and yet the long haul flights, who account for more than fifty percent of Europe's mm. CO two emissions, are completely exempt. You know, everybody I think across Europe would accept that everybody must pay a fair share. But the richest people travelling long haul get an exemption, while the poor people travelling intra-EU on short haul flights pay all the burden. That's manifestly unfair. 
is is SAFs the answer going forward? Do you think sustainable think SAFs, aviation? Yeah, fuel? I mean, I think SAFs have a significant role to play. There isn't one simple answer. If there was a simple answer, we'd all implement a simple answer. I mean, Ryanair is investing more than t- up to twenty billion dollars in new technology aircraft for the next five years. You know, the new Max Game Changer aircraft carries four percent more seats, burns sixteen percent less fuel, mm-hmm. reduces noise emissions by forty percent. So, new technology, I think, is the most critical role. SAFs undoubtedly uh, could play a significant uh, role. But to get SAFs, you know, we, the challenge with SAFs is we need it in large volumes at Europe's airports. And that's not going to happen, I think, without European governmental support. You know, if you're t- going to take, and Ryanair paid 630 million euros in environmental taxation in the last year, in 2019, pre COVID, not one penny of that environmental taxation was spent on the environment. Mm. We would call on European governments, use that money to uh, research, develop, produce uh, sustainable aviation fuels in large quantities and make it available at airports so that actually it does become a realistic choice. It's not available at the moment. So, so we're getting to that chicken and egg thing, aren't we? Is the way the Commission and Europe generally does that is to mandate the fuel and to provide a, you know, a, the, the fuel producers say we can produce a SAF, what we need is a, a sensible regulatory framework that we can rely on. And yet, Willie Walsh at IATA, for example, is saying it's madness to create a mandate until such time as you've got the fuel. I mean, which comes first in that? Uh, look, in my humble view, the supply comes first, you know. There's no point in mandating unless you actually you can deliver a supply there. And the challenge is that the fuel companies say lots of things. Mm. They don't have and are not able to produce sufficient SAFs in sufficient quantities to do anything other than the occasional PR flight. Yeah. Now, I think it's reasonable... Uh, for us as an industry to have a goal. I mean, Europe says a goal of 5% SAS by 2030. We've set ourselves a goal of 12.5%. 12.5, yes. I don't think I'll get to 12.5%, but at least we've set a goal. that'll be a supply issue, you think? It'll be a supply issue. I mean, the mm-hmm. challenge there, you know, I mean, I spend about $2 billion a year on fuel. You know, can I, can I generate or can I you know, take delivery of... 200, 250 million worth of SAFs. No, it doesn't exist at the moment at most of my airports. I need that at 240 EU airports. Yeah. Most airports aren't even geared up for delivering SAFs. Well, indeed. And and those that are, of course, have to put it into the fuel hydrants and then yeah. it doesn't actually make it to the aeroplane even though you purchased it. But that's yeah. another issue. So coming back, though, to your perhaps the smart way to do... Well, no, t- two questions. First... The SAFs are going to be, for the foreseeable future, more expensive, aren't they? Yeah. Even as fuel price, you know, current age sure. one goes up. Is that a sort of a de facto tax? I think it is a de facto tax, but it's all, I mean, I would live with that. I think our, my customers would live with that. But the, the challenge is that's where governments need to play a role. Governments need to take the environmental taxes that they're taking from airlines. And in my case, that was 630 million the last year pre-COVID, which was about four euros 30 per passenger. I mean, mm. about a 10% ta- rate of tax on my average airfare of 40 euros. So the money is there. But what governments need to do is to take that money and either subsidise uh, the cost of SAFs or use it to help increase the production and the volume production in scalable volumes of F- SAFs and deliver it at Europe's at their airports. Mm. So moving, moving sort of on, but at the same time, one of the ways in which you're going to get aeroplanes full again, of course, is to keep your costs right down. So very bravely, I'm going to ask you about charges. Mm. Uh, do you think that the ANSPs, for example, should have been able to do what they did? I mean, wasn't that exactly the regulatory framework the airlines demanded? And now, and now that it's turned out to go over the line, all of a sudden they're crying foul? I mean, you know, nobody envisaged a COVID, you know, mm. nobody envisaged a COVID pandemic which would have grounded the airlines for 18 months. I mean, what we wanted was, uh, you know, a regulatory environment where you'd get kind of exposed A and S P costs. Now, I, I take the, 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 you look at the last 18 months of COVID. The EU, rightly or wrongly, said, fine, the airlines were not allowing you to fly. But by the way, you have to compensate or refund all of your passengers, mm. despite the fact 90% have paid a non-refundable effort. You must compensate all those passengers, give them full refunds. Fine. We understand that. That's what we'll do. But then they come along and say, oh, but by the way, you must now pay the ANSP charges for the last 18 months, despite the fact that you didn't use those ANSP services. Mm. Um, you have to subsidise them as well because they're government-protected government monopolies. Now, something's wrong there. Mm. We can't, on the one hand, be asked to subsidise these government monopoly providers of ANSP services whose services we didn't use. And then with no revenues because we've had to refund all of our passengers for the 18 months of flights which were cancelled by European governments. I mean, 
in my view, European governments should have compensated the airlines for those losses and costs. But of course, no, they are all very happy to make the airlines the kind of insurer of last resort. And what they do then is you have this circular system where the legacy airlines get billions of state aid to help yeah. them pick up those costs. But the unstate or the non-legacy airlines, the Ryanairs, the EasyJets, I would say BA and others, receive no such money. And yet we're expected to fund those kind of costs. It's manifestly unfair. The level playing field has been destroyed in Europe in the last, I think, two or three years because of the massive quantities of state aid that have been handed out unnecessarily to Lufthansa, Air France, Alitalia, TAP. And yet we're all treated the same when it comes to we all now have to com- we have to f- compete with those guys who have received more in state aid than we will generate in revenues for the next two or three mm. years. And, and I presume the same is true of the airports as well and the airport charges. Well, uh, but to be fair to the airports, I mean, you know, we didn't fly, so the airports don't get paid. Mm. You know, but you have kind of airports, you know, I have no axe to grind. Airports like Heathrow, you know, who during the COVID pandemic paid out a dividend of 120 million to their shareholders, which is generally rich pension funds and the mm. Sultan of Brunei or Qatar. Uh, and then they come back post COVID and say, we want a 50% price increase. You know, it, for what? Oh, because our shareholders deserve to be rewarded for the risky investment of owning Heathrow. Like, it is manifest nonsense. So how do we get to a place where we share the risk? We will never get to a place where we share the risk, but we do need to get to a place where you have much more effective regulation in Europe. Deregulation of the airlines has worked, has been one of the great transformational transformational, uh, economic policies of the European Union. But we failed to go forward and deregulate the airports and deregulate ANSP providers. Mm. And I think we need that's where we need to go next. Deregulate the airports. You know, we have this regulation, certainly in the UK, where Heathrow is protected come what may. ADP protected come what may. You know, we should be deregulated. There should be a much more aggressive regulation of their charges. And you stop them building marble palaces or marble cathedrals where they just pass the costs on to the consumer. And when it comes to ANSPs, let's accept that the single European sky has been a complete shambolic failure in Europe for the last mm-hmm. 25 years. It has gone nowhere. It will never go anywhere. We no longer need ANSP services. No. You know. And I think what we should do is deregulate the ANSP services. Frankly, I can get my flight services from flight tracker. I, yep. You can buy them on a website. All the airlines or aircraft are fitted with collision avoidance systems anyway. Now, we don't want to eliminate ATC services altogether. They do have a role. But frankly, the Belgian air traffic control system can provide ATC services over France. The Irish can provide it over Spain. Let them all compete against each other. Mm. And that way, by introducing competition... Uh, for those services, you would actually significantly lower the cost of providing those services and significantly improve the production and the delivery of the service. Music to my ears, of course. So my last question, just to come back, if I may, to the sustainability point. Mm. Uh, well, my second last question, uh, just to come back to the sustainability point. I seem to remember from your, your speaking yesterday, you offer your passengers an offset system. You're mm. offering your passengers incredibly cheap fares. Mm. Um, a colleague of mine flew from from Manchester yesterday for four pounds ninety nine p. Yeah. Uh, and yet, when you offer your passengers a, a, an offset scheme of their own, the uplift seems to be fairly poor. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that's to be uh, to be expected. People want low fare air travel, uh, and people want somebody else to pay the environmental taxation. You give people the opportunity. Do you want to uh, uh, to com- to voluntarily offset your carbon footprint. Let 1% of our passengers take that up. But I think a lot of those 1%. are... 1%. Yeah, and I, I suspect a lot of those are the corporate passengers where there's a corporate mm. policy of offsetting mm. carbon footprint. So I do think, you know, we're going to have to have a better, fairer, more transparent way of taxing air travel or certainly taxing aviation fuel into the future that on the one hand says we get back all the failed environmental taxes we now pay, ETS, APD and all those other nonsense taxes. And I think maybe tax fuel at the point of uplift across Europe. Mm. And then you'd have a much more fair and transparent way of everybody paying their fair share. But I, I'm, I'm still, I mean, I, I can't disagree with that. And if we did that, we could sort of stop up offsetting as well, which mm. is something of a uh, mystery. Mm. Um, but I'm still fascinated that people who are only paying, you know, your average fare you said was 40 euros, but then think somehow or other they don't need to pay anything for their carbon footprint as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have some sympathy for them. Remember, firstly, if they're transferring down to Ryanair from an Air France or a KLM or a, a Lufthansa, 
they're already reducing their carbon footprint by 50% by switching mm. from the legacy airline to the low-cost carrier. But asking people to voluntarily pay simply doesn't work. There needs to be some reasonable but fair and transparent system of every airline passenger contributing towards their carbon footprint. The problem with the system in Europe at the moment is we exempt all the most polluting uh, airlines and passengers, which is long haul connecting and business yeah. class travel. The richest people get an exemption and the poor people, which are the people travelling point to point on low fare airlines across Europe, shoulder the entire burden. Yeah. Manifestly unfair. Right. So, my la- my, again, <laughs> my second, second last question. Uh, on social issues, Ryanair did a very good job, didn't they, of not um, firing staff, of yeah. not even furloughing staff, unlike many of your colleagues, many of your legacy carrier colleagues. How did you do that? How did you manage to keep the staff on? Well, I mean, two things. One, we participate in all the wage support system schemes across Europe, you know, and you know, we're very grateful for that. You know, we acknowledge that, you know, we would not have been able to survive the COVID pandemic if we hadn't received those wage support systems. But a lot of our pilots and cabin crew took a hit, mm. you know, because they were all capped. Yeah. But the other thing I think we did cleverly in Ryanair, we committed ourselves from day one, we're going to keep everybody on, on the payroll and current. So we kept our aircraft flying once a month, our pilots and all our cabin crew flying once a month, even if it meant setting an aircraft up with you know 80 or 100 pilots and cabin crew once a month to make sure everybody was current. And that's one of the reasons I think Ryanair has been so quick to recover post-COVID. We've had all the aircraft, all the pilots, all the cabin crew ready to rock and roll. Uh, and that's why we've been able to restore schedules so dramatically. And you look at most of our competitors across Europe, they've been cancelling flights because they're short of pilots. Pilots need to go back in the simulator because they were furloughed. Uh, others, our Eastern European competitors, just sacked or, or let people go, particularly cabin crew. And now they're struggling to get them to come back. So I, I think we've been through these crises before. We knew that the, one of the differentiators in Ryanair was keeping our people on board. Our pilots have agreed to pay cuts of 10 to 20 percent. Our cam crew agreed to pay cuts of between 5 and 10 percent. Management took significant pay cuts as well. So we all had to tighten our belts. Uh, and I think everybody accepts that in Ryanair, we're, getting, we're paying ourselves less. That was the only way to survive the pandemic. And as we emerge out of it, hopefully into the next year or two, we can restore those pay cuts. And that's our first priority is to restore the pay cuts to our pilots and our cam crew over the next two or three years so we get everybody back to where they were pre-COVID. But to do that, we need to get our traffic back to where it was pre-COVID and we need to get the airfares up to where they were pre-COVID. It's fine to be carrying about 80 or 90 percent of our pre-COVID traffic as we did in October, mm. but at 30 percent lower airfares. Yeah. That's not sustainable. You know, so, we, so you do fear, you do see airfares rising. I think it's inevitable airfares mm. will rise, certainly into the summer, certainly into the summer of 2022, as we emerge out of the post-COVID pandemic. There are there is 20 percent less capacity, short haul mm-hmm. capacity in Europe. And Italia has gone from 110 aircraft down to 55. Uh, Thomas Cook's gone bust. Fly mm-hmm. B has disappeared. So there is less capacity. Airfares will rise. Um, we hope to get them back to kind of pre pandemic levels. And the first thing we've committed is that as we as we restore airfares and profitability, we restore the pay of our people who've taken the pain in the last two years. Right. So my last question, uh, my standard question. Any further thoughts for Eamon? Any further thoughts on, on what's going on? Yeah, I would challenge Eamon and Eurocontrol. I mean, Eurocontrol are at the heart of what's going on, particularly with the NSPs. And I think they've done great work here in the last, well, in the last summer pre-COVID. You know, when the Karlsruhe ATC system was under real intense pressure, Eurocontrol was able to reroute flights across Polish airspace, across Italian airspace. We need more of that. I mean, I see... Eurocontrol being the key to kind of the deregulation of air tra- of ANSP provision across Europe. Eurocontrol should be the central provider of ATC services. It should have the freedom to contract with the French, the Germans, the Belgians. And we buy those ATC services from Eurocontrol. So, and remember, there's a huge environmental prize in this. If we could mm. eliminate through deregulation, and I believe we will eliminate through deregulation of ANSPs, ATC delays, flight cancellations on Saturdays because of a, a ATC capacity uh, shortage, just because people won't turn up to work. We would eliminate about 90% of all EU airlines flight delays. We would dramatically reduce fuel consumption on okay. European airlines across. And I think you would have between a 10 to 20% reduction in fuel consumption and emissions of European aviation simply by effective reform of the European ATC system. It's not just a cost saving for our citizens. There's a huge environmental saving as well.
a perfect note to finish on. Michael, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Andrew. Good thank to see you for your time. You. My pleasure. You too. Uh, thank you to all of you for watching. I'm delighted to say that Straight Talk will be back next year. We have already got a number of really interesting speakers lined up. I'm really looking forward to uh, those conversations and I really hope you'll join us back in 2022. And in the meantime, I wish you all the very best for the Christmas and holiday season. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.